Welcome to a very special edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series. On this episode, we had the honor of interviewing the legendary alto saxophonist Lou Donaldson. During an open, raw, and refreshing conversation, Lou spoke to Neon Jazz about anything and everything that he felt worthy. Initially, we spoke about the influence Charlie Parker's playing had on him, his time playing in Kansas City over the years, the legends he has shared the stage with, and recently how he felt about becoming an NEA jazz master, and many, many other things. And please, do me this favor, dig it, my friends. Hello. Yeah, hi, Lou, it's Joe Domino with Neon Jazz. All right. Thank you, sir, for taking my call and having some time here. First of all, talk to me about your association with Mr. Charlie Parker. Uh, I knew him, you know, when the when association. <laughs> I knew him when I saw him. Now, did you did you gig with him? What did he teach you about? Uh, no, I never, I never played a job with him. I played some jam sessions with him. I never played a job with him. What did he teach you about jazz? Well, just about everything that I knew. He didn't teach me. I just picked up his style, you know. Sure. Talk to me about North Carolina, where you were born. How how influential was North Carolina on on your appreciation for jazz? Uh, nothing. You know, North Carolina is a country and western uh, state. So we, we didn't have a it wasn't, it wasn't even a jazz show down there. So what about so was it until you went to New York City where you really kind of got your? Uh, no, I went to North Carolina A and T College, and then the students actually came from New York and brought records. And actually, when I heard Charlie Park, I went to the Navy in 1945. And when I was in Chicago, that's where I heard Charlie Parker. And he influenced me, you know, to, to play, like, play the way I play. Absolutely. Anybody else really influenced the way you played? Not really. I used to, before I heard him, I played a little bit like Johnny Hodges and uh, people like that, Pete Brown, stuff like that. But uh, he was so big, actually, I was a clarinet player when I got in the Navy band. Wow. And uh, I was so, you know, uh, upset with his playing until, <laughs> until I just, I didn't give up the it, but I, I took up the also and that was it. Interesting. So talk to me about when you first arrived in, in New York. What was it like to get involved with that scene? Well, in, in, when I got there in the, in, the, in the late 40s, it was uh, uh, clubs everywhere, music everywhere. Musicians everywhere. Most of them, you know, strung out, you know. Yeah. Using vitamins and um, and it was it was it was. I, well, when I went there, I was still a GI. Sure. So I went to a GI school. Yeah. And got GI benefits and uh and a music school down on Broadway. Right. Nola Studios and uh, it was two or three schools right in that district. And they had bands where you could go and practice and rehearse, and a lot of musicians. It was great. It was it was great. And then in Harlem, they had uh, fifteen to twenty clubs where you could play jazz. It was great. Right on. So when you got approached by Blue Notes the first time to lay down a record, what was that like? Well, I was working at Men's Playhouse in Alfred Line. The president Blue Note came by there and asked me, "Did I want to make a record for um, Blue Note?" And I told him, of course, you know. And uh, he said, uh, can you play like Charlie Parker? <laughs> 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 now, I couldn't play like Charlie Parker, but I said, yeah, I can play that way. <laughs> 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 and I, I, don't know, I, I don't know how he thought I was going to help him. <laughs> <laughs> but I made this record with Milt Jackson's quartet. And from then on, you know, you know the rest of the story. Well, you went for, you, so you, with Milt, Percy... Mr. Lewis and Kenny Clark, you guys became the modern jazz quartet, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the best sounds jazz ever produced. What was that tenure like? Well, at that time, I didn't even think about that, you know. Because at that time, it was just the Mill Jackson Quartet. But later, they, 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 you know, they became the modern jazz quartet. So, what, what was it like to perform with someone like Milt Jackson? Well, it was great for me, you know, because I been hearing him with Dennis's band, you know. Sure. And, and I liked him, and, uh, you know, he was great. That's wonderful. So the 1950s was really a galvanizing point for you to kind of get baptized into jazz. How would you sum up that decade for you as far as recording and, and laying down music? 
Well, in the 1970s, the music was changing slightly. The music was changing because the musicians had uh, musicians had uh, started experimenting with jazz and kind of took it away from where it was supposed to be. Right. And uh, I started making a lot of organ records, and uh, basically because I wanted to sell them, you know. Mm-hmm. Because uh, like the music business is like anything else, I don't know why people who, who critic, crit, critics and people who try to critique the music don't understand that. But, you know, I'm not saying they're stupid, but, you know, if you make a record for a company, if it doesn't sell, they won't, they won't record you anymore. Right. So naturally, when you make a record, you're trying to sell it. Yeah. So you can keep recording and making money. But uh, that's what was happening back then, and it was great with Blue Note, and then CTI came on. Yeah. With Creed Taylor and his people, Freddie Hubbard and all those people, you know, it was great. Grover Washington, it was great. So you've played with almost everybody under the sun that, that people can even imagine in jazz. Who do you miss playing with? Like getting on stage, gigging, jamming? Who is it that you think, man, I'd love to get on stage again and, and do it again with that person? Well, I don't know. It was all of them. I played with everybody. So it doesn't, I don't have any one particular person uh, unless you're talking about Clifford Brown. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess you got Monk, you got a lot. I just thought maybe someone might have popped into mind. I didn't want to sing yeah, well, Monk wasn't that fun to play with because Monk never um, wrote out his music. You had to learn it, you know. It was kind of tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what What's the best jazz advice you ever got? I don't know. The only, only jazz, best jazz advice I ever got was from old guys, and they would always tell me, if you, if you don't play the blues, you lose. <laughs> so what, what does it feel like after a long, winding, influential career and your music's everywhere? How does it feel? Do you ever sit back and think, man, this has been one hell of a ride? Yeah, and I think now, I don't know what I would be playing if I was living today, you know, with TV and all the stuff they got now. Because back then, we, you, had, you had to go out to a club to hear music. You couldn't, you couldn't hear it anywhere if you didn't let you went to the club. Yeah. And they didn't have, you know, when, when I started, there was no TV, no nothing. Sure. Actually, no radio either. You know, very few people had radios. Yeah. And it, uh, you had to go out and find the musicians and listen to them play. Yeah. You've, you've spent some time here in Kansas City since we're out of Kansas City. Talk to me about some of your memories of playing on 18 and Vine and just kind of the overall Kansas City thing. Yeah, the Blue Room. And, I, and when I came to Kansas City, it was in the late 50s, late 50s. And um, they had, uh, it was still segregation, you know, as Black Musicians Union. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we used to go up to the Black Musicians Union. And I'm responsible for the uh, Charlie Parker Foundation now because uh, I went up there and they had pictures of musicians on the wall of everybody, Count Basie and all those people, that's so young. And they didn't have a picture of Charlie Parker. And I asked the guy, why didn't they have a picture of Charlie Parker? And he said the president of the union didn't like Charlie Parker because Charlie Parker, you know, was a junkie. And he came around begging people for money and... People would eat a sandwich, and when they got back, he done stole a sandwich and ate it. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and they didn't like him, so they didn't put his picture up. So I asked anybody in there, did they have a picture? There was a guy named Eddie Baker. Mm-hmm. was around there, and uh, Eddie, see, I got a picture at my house. I said, go get it. So he went and got it. And I stuck the picture up with a tack. I stuck it on the wall. <laughs> Very nice. I, and I told him to detail the president, I put it up there. Right on. And then I'll, I'll be here every morning. You know, after the gig, you go up there and eat. Yeah. You get uh, get food at the union. And I say, tell him I'll be here every night. Tell him I don't care what he does when I leave, but I won't see this picture up here every night while I'm here. Absolutely. And I think they kept it up there. They kept it up there. And then Eddie Baker said he'd been trying to do something for Charlie Parker, and they, and they didn't like Charlie Parker, so they weren't interested. So he wanted to start a foundation. And I had a day off because I had to go to Wichita, but I didn't have to be there until Tuesday. Yeah. And I told him, okay. So we'll put a concert over in his house, play it in his yard. Yeah. We put a speaker up in the tree, 
and they just put a you know bucket out there. He didn't have no charge or nothing, donations, and he could raise about five hundred dollars. Wow! And he started the Charlie Parker Foundation. That's how it got started. Yeah, right on. In Kansas City, I got a medal in my house right now from Eddie. You know he's dead now, but I got a medal. Uh, you know, claiming that I'm the one that to help him get the Charlie Parker Foundation started. That's wonderful. Other people don't know that. No. Know, but, you know, no, definitely. I don't think any many people know that. No, they don't know anything about that. You know, it's just, it's weird because uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I, I came to Kansas City all the time. Yeah. I must have played that three four times a year. Right on. In the sixties and seventies and even in the eighties. Yeah, that's great. I'm good friends with uh, Ollie Gates, who owns the real place. You know, he, he's a good friend of mine. That's great. Yeah, and. Uh, Kansas City was a great town for me. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, and, and he might even play Tulsa, Wichita. Yeah, that's wonderful. So speaking of having medals, you just got awarded the NEA Jazz Masters. What was that like? Well, it, it wasn't anything much to me. It's too late. I should have had that 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's just too late. I told him when I made my speech, you know. It's like an afterthought to me because it's too too late now, you know. Yeah. Because I'm 87 years old. You know, they gave me, you know, the money. And I said, nothing I can do with it now, but put it in the bank, you know. <laughs> you know if you had it a few years ago, I would have had a ball with this money. Man, <laughs> there you go. That's nice. You, you've had all kinds of fans that you've performed in front of your whole life. What's the nicest thing a fan has ever said to you? Well, I don't know. It's a million fans. I've got a million fans, man. Everywhere I go, I've got fans. Yeah. But the nicest thing in the, in the United States when I travel around, I don't do it now, but I used to go in these places, and a lot of people told me that, uh, that you know, the Blues Walk, my um, most famous piece, uh, that they used to uh, make love to that, you know, and that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible for them, man. A lot of people spoke <laughs> that every time they had a dance. And, you know, that's what they would, they would use when they grabbed their wife, you know. And uh, that's, that's amazing. I used to laugh at it, but it was funny. That's awesome. That's great. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a swinging, it is a swinging tune. You know? Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. So you traveled Europe quite a bit. What country really got your music and really responded to you the best? I, mean, I, I hate to tell you, but all of them, all of them. Right on. All of them. I made a tour in Spain last year, and uh, it was amazing. You know, at my age now, you know, everything I play like is nostalgia. Because actually, if you want to hear the way I'm playing, you have to hear me because, you know, nobody else plays that way, you know. Yeah. The younger musicians, they into something else, you know, which is, is, is par for the course. You know how that is. Yeah. There's always something new coming up. But people would come up to me actually with tears in their eyes. You know, after I played like an alligator boogaloo or something like that. Yeah. Because they, they don't they don't hear it anymore. And it, it's amazing. Yeah. In countries, I even went to Russia. I didn't even know people knew that much about jazz in Russia, but they knew everything. Wow, that's you great. Know, where I was born, you know, my mother, my father, they study. <laughs> that's great. Music. And don't go to Japan. It's just, it's, you go to, we can try to go out and get, you know, like Burger Kings and stuff, because we don't want the Japanese food. And uh, it'll be 50 people that with albums for you to sign. Wow. So they saw you go in there, and everybody would tell everybody, and they'd run out with the albums, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So. That's let me ask you this. You've played with a lot of musicians over the years. Is there anybody that you would have liked to have either played with or met that you didn't? Uh, no. You know, I met everybody. Right on. I met everybody. I, it's just, you know, nobody you could name that I didn't meet. And I played with most of them, too. See, I'm, I'm right in between uh, what we call the crack. Yeah. Because I, I got to see all of the old Dixieland musicians mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Yeah. And when I went into the Navy in Chicago, I used to go down to the Dixieland section and listen to all the old musicians play. Right on. And uh, and then I heard all of the swing music because, you know, I'm, I'm in that age. Yeah. All the big bands, all of them, Count Basic, Duke, Jimmy Lunch, with all those bands. 
And then I got all the bebop because that's my era. Yeah. And then I got all the avant garde too. I got I'm young know, right in the crack. I got a whole. I was born at the right time. Yeah. I got all four of them. Absolutely. So what are you listening to these days? What's the last album or song you listened to before we talk today? Uh, it's hard for me to say. I listen to music choice at night. They got something they run on TV at night. It's a special station, music choice. Yeah. And I listen to the uh, records that they play. I don't know what's the last thing I listen to because uh, most of the musicians now I don't even know. And they play so bad I don't want to hear it anyway, you know what <laughs> Yeah. It's, 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 it's now, it's a music, uh, it's like overkill, you know, they know too much about music, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they play so good, it's, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, I hear ya, I hear ya. Too Let perfect, me, it's too perfect now, you know. Yeah. Let me ask you this, how do you want the world to remember you? Well, I want them to remember me as a guy who came into music with a little talent and and put a smart head and figured out the system because I had to figure it out in order to make make you know money and there was a little money I made and I figured it right on the nose you know mm -hmm. I listened to it and when I used my band I'd go out and play and what the people responded to is what I would record yeah and that was like 100 percent right and uh, I was a lucky guy, and I played, I got to play with everybody. And uh, I was a happy guy, still a happy guy now. Blue, you're a class act, sir. Thank you for your time, and keep on keeping on, man. I love your music. Yeah, and tell everybody that I missed out there that you know that I said hello. I will, Lou. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks for listening and tuning into a very special Neon Jazz interview session where we give you a bit of insight into the legends that have given us all that jazz for all these decades. And thanks to the legendary Lou Donaldson for his insight, candor, and brilliance. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time... Enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.